Science. Engineering. Medicine. Yes, chemistry. Physics. Biology. Humanity. Cardiology. Computer. Public health. Global. Science. Communication. Hello everyone, I'm Gareth Mitchell and in this edition we're hearing about supersonic and hypersonic flight. But we're slowing down a bit too to discuss the worrying environmental effects of the treatments we spray onto our pets or get them to swallow. What we're talking about here is worm pills, flea treatments. It's the kind of parasite treatments that many pet owners are picking up from the vets or indeed in many cases from pet shops and pharmacies now. And the reality is these medications, these chemicals are pesticides. And they're finding their way into our rivers, ponds and lakes where they're causing real harm. Also in the podcast, tackling tuberculosis through mathematical modelling. The Imperial College Podcast. All right, well, as we always do, we're going to jump in with some news around the college. And today we have a double bill of Imperial news from none other than Conrad Duncan. Uh, Thanks for being here, Conrad. And uh, one of the stories you've been involved with has been really hitting the headlines. In fact, both these ones have. But let's start with the study into DMT. It's a compound and it's a psychedelic compound, isn't it? And this is research about how it affects people's brains in brain scanners. What a story. So what do we need to know? Yeah, so this is a study that's been published in PNAS from Imperial's Centre of Psychedelic Research. So scientists were looking at, as you say, DMT, which is a powerful psychedelic known to alter conscious experience for its effect on brain activity. So DMT can produce very kind of intense uh, and immersive altered states of consciousness. The feeling of maybe like visiting an alternative reality or seeing things that aren't real, what we think of as hallucinations. And it's the um, the major psychoactive compound in ayahuasca, which is a psychedelic brew that it's used in um, ceremonies in Central and uh, South America. Now, what was going on in this study is that scientists were basically looking at tracking brain activity before, during and after this experience in kind of better detail than ever before. And what they found is that during this experience, there was increased connectivity across the brain uh, with changes that were most prominent in areas linked to what we think of as higher level functions, so imagination. So Dr. Chris Timmerman, who is the lead author of this study, he says that human brains model an unusually large amount of the world. So for example, when you have an optical illusion, what our brain is doing is it's basically filling in the blanks of what we would expect to see based on information we already have, rather than showing us what we're actually seeing. And under DMT, activities in these areas and systems of the brain become highly dysregulated. And this is what leads to the trip experience as we know it. Obviously, this research is just fascinating in its own right. Fascinating insight into what's going on in the brain under these altered states. But do the researchers see a further endpoint to this? Is there a clinical endpoint, for instance, to understanding these interactions? Yeah, so studying uh, DMT in this way when the brain is in this extreme state of altered consciousness is useful for us understanding how brain activity affects consciousness in our general lives. But it's also important to understand how DMT works and how it has the effects that it does on the brain because DMT is one of the various psychedelics that has potential as a treatment for depression and um, other mental illnesses as has previously been looked at with uh, psilocybin, the um, active compound in magic mushrooms. All right. Uh, Conrad, while I have you, let's talk about another compound that gets a lot of attention. This has also been a big news story Imperial's been involved with, and it's caffeine and what it has to do with the likes of obesity and type 2 diabetes. Yes, this is research from our uh, School of Public Health, and they've basically been looking at how high blood caffeine levels may reduce body weight and the risk of type 2 diabetes. Now, there's been lots and lots of research over the years about caffeine and its impact on health. What's interesting about this study is they use a technique called Mendelian randomization. And this basically uses genetic variants as a tool to investigate the relationship between a trait and an outcome. So in this case, they're looking at two genes that are associated with the speed of caffeine metabolism in the body. And essentially what they found is that having a high blood caffeine level reduces body weight and the risk of type 2 diabetes. Now, what Mendelian randomization is able to do is it can show a causal relationship, which observational studies can't show in the same way. Observational studies are great at showing a correlation, but it's hard to disentangle all the other factors that are going on in a person's life that may be impacting their health and to 
to like separate caffeine from those issues. So Dr. Dependa Gill, uh, who's senior author of the study, notes that further research is needed for inv- individuals who should use these results to guide their dietary preferences. But it does suggest that the findings show that there may be worth in exploring the potential use of caffeine-free carbonated drinks in lowering the risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes in patients. All right, so there you are. That's caffeine and DMT all in the same news section and uh, a busy time for you as well. So thanks for taking time to talk to us. That's uh, Conrad Duncan. All right, now, when I was younger, I wanted to be either a Concorde pilot or a space explorer. So more recently, when I found out that Imperial had a podcast all about supersonic and hypersonic travel hosted by an astronaut, well, I hit that download button very, very quickly. And I humbly suggest you do too. I've been listening to an edition of the Zero Pressure podcast from Imperial College and Saab. It's billed as a relaxed conversation with those on the cutting edge of science and technology hosted by Britain's first astronaut, Helen Sharman. Well, having consumed the super and hypersonic edition, I've been working my way through the back catalogue as well, checking out episodes on 5G, the hydrogen revolution and quantum computing. But to give you a taster, let's go supersonic. Here's Helen in conversation with Conrad Banks of the Aerospace Division at Rolls-Royce PLC. I actually saw the last Concorde aircraft landing in in Bristol in 2003. I remember it vividly. There was a a very unfortunate uh, incident in Paris that people remember the crash of of Concorde. uh, And very sadly, a lot of people lost their lives. Uh, It was a freak accident, but the industry lost confidence. And it wasn't a viable concern going forwards. So British Airways, Air France were losing money. The aircraft was declined and services stopped. Now, at the very end, it was very popular, but Concorde never recovered from that crash in Paris all those years ago. If it was still flying today, I think there'd be lots of question marks about the environmental concerns and the drive for sustainability. And uh, that's going to be a very important factor when we talk about the future of high speed. So what do we need to overcome then? If we're going to have supersonic travel commercially again I think you're saying are you saying that we we need it there is a demand for it you think again now of course there's a demand people want to travel at speed it drives huge benefits to society but equally you know our planet is precious and and we can't risk climate change and and other environmental issues just for the convenience of traveling across the Atlantic and the Pacific at two, three, four times the speed of sound. So we have to find that marriage where we can deliver a sustainable supersonic high-speed future with an affordable future. So we have to introduce a lot more technologies that enable us to travel fast and deliver that that huge advantage to society that that high-speed will bring. There is a demand. We know there's a demand but we cannot do it in such a way that we risk the sustainability and the environmental concerns of of net zero. So we're thinking about emissions, are we, in particular for sustainability. So how do we make sure that those emissions are going to be suitably low for supersonic travel? It's not just about the, the emissions being low, it's about the net zero aspect of that. The higher and the faster you fly you actually burn more fuel per mile. It's less efficient. It's far more efficient to fly people in an A350 than fly people in a a later supersonic aircraft when they are developed. So they are going to be less efficient. And the other challenge of going supersonically is you need even more power density. So in Rolls-Royce, we are doing a lot of work on, on electric propulsion, hybrid electric propulsion. We've just tested a gas turbine that runs on hydrogen. But none of those are suitable for long distance high speed flight because of the energy and the power density that you need. So we have to face the reality that we need some form of hydrocarbon fuel and it will emit CO2. But that CO2 has to be part of a net zero cycle. So it is absolutely essential if we're going to have a future in high-speed commercial flight, that sustainable aviation fuels, SAF, or better still, synthetic aviation fuel, that's synthesised from from water, from the air, powered fully by renewables. And in Rolls-Royce, we are looking at small modular reactors, for example, that are going to provide that that, that carbon-free power, but solar and wind, sustainable manufacture of fuel. 
so that the carbon is absorbed from the air and then when it is flown at high speed it is put back it's net zero that's the only way this is going to work if we dig up a gram of fossil fuel to power supersonics and future high mac we are failing society it's just not acceptable now, quickly before you go, Conrad, um, how many years do you think it's going to be before we actually see a fully operational supersonic passenger aircraft? If you involve business jets, we said passengers, within the next 12 years. Gosh, that's exciting. 12 years. Mid- mid-30s. Yeah. Wow. Exciting. And, and that's passenger paying. First flights well before then. Conrad Banks, Chief Engineer, Defence Future Programmes at Rolls-Royce, talking there to Helen Sharman on the excellent Zero Pressure podcast. And like many other titles from Imperial, you can find it on our shiny new podcast directory. Access it via the Be Inspired pages on the college website. Well, now let's talk about parasite treatments for our pets. Now, they help get rid of fleas or ticks, but research says that the chemicals are getting into rivers, lakes and ponds and threatening aquatic wildlife. There's a load of detail on the problem in a new briefing note from the Grantham Institute. One of the authors is Rhys Preston Allen, and he's pulled together a panel of experts to discuss the issue. Altogether, there are around 25 million cats and dogs in the UK. These animals are routinely dosed with parasiticides, drugs that can protect against parasites like fleas, ticks, lice and worms. But how much do we know about the impacts of parasiticides on the natural world? In our Grantham Institute briefing paper, we explore the potential hidden impacts of these chemicals within our waterways. Could the cost of allowing these chemicals into the environment outweigh the benefits to our pets? Today, we're joined by a bounty of environmental researchers and students based at Imperial College, Dr. Leon Barron and Hamish dunkarf youngson alongside our veterinary activist-in-chief, Dr. Andrew Prentice. So, Andrew, as our resident vet, would you be able to define what a pet parasiticide is for us and perhaps give us an idea of how they might be getting into wild ecosystems? Right, pet parasiticide is a bit of a mouthful. In lay terms, what we're talking about here is worm pills, flea treatments. It's the kind of parasite treatments that many pet owners are picking up from the vets or indeed, in many cases, from pet shops and pharmacies now. And the reality is these medications, these chemicals are pesticides. And so we are using significant quantities of pesticides on our pets and we are now increasingly concerned that some of these products are getting out into the environment. And we know that because there's already been documented work showing that some of these products are out in the, in the waterways. And this project is largely about trying to find out how extensive that is. So the question is, how might these products get out into the environment for the topical preparation, so the things which are generally referred to as spot on so these would be liquids drops you put perhaps on the back of your dog or cat's neck and they diffuse out into the coat and then into your your pet in order to kill the parasites well they don't instantly absorb if your dog for example then went for a swim in a river then there's a significant possibility that some of this product will wash off into the river but actually equally if you were to decide to wash your dog or even wash the bedding that your dog had been sleeping on, or even decide to wash your hands after you put the product on because you've got a couple of drops of the liquid on your hand. In each of those situations, some of that chemical product is going to go down the drain and it will, in all likelihood, go straight through the wastewater treatment works and end up in the rivers. Now, the individual quantity from the individual animal is tiny. With in excess of 20 million pets in in the UK, a large proportion of whom are receiving treatment frequently, you have got potential for significant wash-off. Now, the other type of medications are the ones that are given in tablet form. It's largely unknown at this stage, and we are now looking for those products because even if they're taken by mouth, the route of excretion. Are they going to come out in the poop? Are they going to come out in the urine? Are they going to work? Somewhere that parasiticide may be ending up in a waterway, may be up, ending up in landfill. There are multiple different routes for which these products could get to the environment, which are not immediately obvious as you apply, with all good intentions, something to control parasites on your pets. Through the years, 
There appears to be a fairly consistent cycle of chemicals being introduced as biocides and then banned. So Andrew, what's the current state of play for the chemicals used in pet parasiticides? One of the difficulties is that for medicines used on companion animals, there is relatively low requirement for assessment of environmental risk. There has always been an assumption in the past that these products did not get into the environment because they were used on pets, and therefore the bar was set pretty low. Now, that knowledge base is changing. We know they are out there. So it's very important at this stage for us to be able to gather more information so that we can actually start to make policy based on fact rather than on assumption. So Hamish, where do we find evidence of the chemicals used in parasiticides in UK waterways? I'll start by saying that these chemicals are extremely pervasive in general. A paper that came out last year found 98% of rivers sampled had the chemical fipronolin and 66% had the chemical imidacloprid found it. But increasingly what we're finding is that the spatial pattern is that there's a lot more of these chemicals found in greater abundance in urban areas as opposed to rural areas. What's more, with increasing populations, this is a, this is a problem that's, that has the potential to be exacerbated. And Leon, elaborating on that, when we're detecting these chemicals, are they at concentrations of concern? To take an example, imidacloprid, which is one of our pet parasiticides, essentially is very, very toxic at very, very low concentrations. So the current way of assessing whether a substance has any risk in the environment is to find the most sensitive species to that chemical and understand what the lowest concentration is before that has some form of effect on that most sensitive species. So sort of like the worst case scenario. And in this case here, we have a no effect concentration for imidacloprid of a very, very low, uh, 13 nanograms per litre is predicted no effect concentration for imidacloprid. And that value is very, very low, but very much so in the range of what we measure in the environment. The concentrations in the environment are high enough to pose some form of risk. That's Leon Barron and some of his co-authors on that Grantham Institute briefing paper speaking to Rhys Preston Allen. All right, now, this Friday, if you're listening to this on the day that we publish, sees World Tuberculosis Day. That's Friday the 24th of March. So, to mark it, Natasha Kalik of the Institute of Infection has been speaking to Nimalan Aranamanpathy, a professor in mathematical epidemiology in the Faculty of Medicine. He researches human TB transmission and control, and he works with governments on national TB control programmes. He's working mainly with India, which has the world's largest burden of TB, and Kenya, where HIV is a significant driver of tuberculosis. And dealing with TB is a challenge, not least of all because it tends to affect countries with limited resources to deal with epidemics. But computer modelling can help health authorities allocate their scarce resources and set priorities. The conversation begins in India. India's TB programme is probably the largest in the world because their TB epidemic, unfortunately, is the largest in the world. Until recently, they were known by another name, the Revised National Tuberculosis Control Program, but there's been a step change in the amount of ambition. So they're not talking anymore about TB control, they're talking now about TB elimination. And their mission is really to find and treat TB as quickly as possible. In recent years, they've been doing so much more aggressively and also reaching out to other types of interventions like prevention, protecting patients from catastrophic costs and so on. And so it's a very exciting time to be working with programs like that where you have this recent pretty large expansion in control efforts. But India is a huge country, vast and diverse with uh, many different states with many different challenges in terms of their healthcare system, but also their TB burden. And so the response in different states really has to be tailored to their local needs. And so one of the ways in which I've been working with the National Tuberculosis Elimination Program has been to look at each state, state by state, and to look at the evidence there is for their TB burden, to model scenarios for different control strategies in the coming few years, and to address what levels of coverage India would need to achieve in order to meet their ambitious goals for for TB elimination. So you're travelling to India for World TB Day. What work will you be carrying out while you're there? There are a host of different projects that we have in progress. I'm working with the 
TB program at the national level. Now, what we've recently developed is a user-friendly modeling tool. And the idea is that modeling analysis should not be something that's just done by modelers at Imperial, but rather these models should also be accessible to the people actually doing the work in India uh, in terms of delivering the program. And so we try to develop this resource where state level planners, health planners, for example, could easily run different modeling scenarios for their specific states and to see you know, what the impacts of different interventions might be. Another important task for the program is also they've recently conducted a, a huge prevalence survey in the country. And this is where you go out proactively into the community to try and find TB and to you know, try and get a, a better estimate of how much of the disease is actually there in the community. And so I've been working with the program also to help them analyze that data to get a better sense of how much TB there is in the country as a whole. What challenges does microbial resistance pose to the future of tuberculosis research? A drug resistance in tuberculosis is definitely a really important and pressing problem. In India, where I do a lot of my work at the country level, it accounts for only maybe around three to five percent of the incident TB that happens every year. But that's not to say that it's it's a small problem, because if you look at the within country level, what we call the subnational level, there are certain areas in India that really suffer a high burden of um, drug resistance. So Mumbai, for example, a huge megacity in India has a pretty large burden, as well as certain areas in the northeast of the country. And the problem with drug resistant TB is that it is much harder to treat. The treatments are uh, more prolonged. They have worse, much worse side effects and um, uh, all of that for poorer outcomes. And they're extremely expensive as well. And so uh, from a patient welfare point of view, as well as from a program financing point of view, it, it'll become really important to bring down the burden of drug resistant TB. And that's in the case of India. But if you look at uh, several countries in Central and Eastern Europe, for example, they have far higher rates of drug resistant TB. And so the problem is even more urgent and even more pressing in, in those countries. The theme of World TB Day is yes, we can end TB. With this in mind, do you have a message or call to action to other researchers that you would like to share? That's a great question. Yes, I mean, I think after so many years of slow declines of TB burden, and also recently with the disruptions that we've seen during COVID having set us back uh, several years, it's very easy to feel a sense of fatigue and perhaps even a sense of despondency about whether it is possible to do anything about TB. But there are success stories and there are examples in India, in Southeast Asia, in other countries where really focused concerted action has actually brought down TB burden dramatically. And what I would say is now is not the time for fatigue, it's not the time for despondency, it's the time to really redouble our efforts and, and to bring the, the global TB response back on track. That's Nimalan Aranaminpathy speaking to Natasha Kalik ahead of World TB Day on March the 24th. And that brings this edition of the podcast to a close. Of course, at this point, I always like to remind you that we like to go wherever you need us. In other words, on all your favourite podcast platforms. I'm sure you know the ones we mean by now. And uh, if you don't want to listen to the whole thing, then you can, of course, listen to chapterized versions of this podcast. You can find them on our pages via the Be Inspired web pages here at Imperial College. So that'll do for now. I'm Gareth Mitchell on behalf of me and everybody else here on the podcast team. Thanks for listening and goodbye.